Today we got some more actual history about the Creek War of 1813 and 1814. Today's episode took place in December of 1813, when General Claiborne led a small army in southern Alabama into the Creek Nation that was in the northwestern portion of the state. They met the Creeks at a place that was emphatically called the Grave of White Men, known as the Creek Holy Ground. We will be reading from this book. The Creek War of 1813 and 1814 by Henry S. Halbert and Timothy H. Ball. This book was published all the way back in 1895. The Creek prophets, some of whom were Shawnees who had come down and agitated the Creeks to go to war, had told the Creek people that the holy ground was a sacred spot where the bullets of white men could do them no harm. This prophecy would be put to the test when General Claiborne's army arrived. On the 10th of November, General Flournoy wrote to General Claiborne, ordering him to proceed to Weatherford's Bluff, and there establish a depot of provisions for General Jackson, who had written that he was more in dread of famine than of Indians, and that without a supply he could not carry on the campaign. In accordance with this order, on the 13th, General Claiborne broke up his camp at Pine Level, and took up the line of march across Clark County towards the Bluff. The troops manifested the greatest satisfaction on learning their objective point and were greatly elated by the prospect, as they supposed, of an active campaign towards Pensacola. On the route, the Choctaw Battalion under Pushmataha camped for a day and night at Fort Madison, where 20 fine new rifles were distributed among them. On the 16th, the army arrived at the Alabama River, opposite of Weatherford's Bluff. There camped for the night and the next day, by means of rafts, the entire army was landed on the other shore. Here, General Claiborne at once began the construction of a strong stockade, 200 feet square, defended by three blockhouses and a half-moon battery, which commanded the river. In about 10 days, these works were completed and the place received the name of Fort Claiborne in honor of the commander. The town where the fort stood still bears his name. We here quote from Claiborne's Mississippi a letter from General Claiborne to Governor Holmes, dated the 21st of October, 1813, which gives a brief account of the operation at Weatherford's Bluff. I am now in the east bank of the Alabama River, 35 miles above Mims, and in the best part of the enemy's country. From this position, we cut the Indians off from the river and from their growing crops. We likewise render their communication with Pensacola more hazardous. Here will be deposited for the use of General Jackson a supply of provisions, and I hope I shall be ordered to cooperate with them. Colonel Russell of the 3rd U.S. Infantry has been ordered to cooperate with the Georgia troops, and is now on his march to this place. We have by several excursions alarmed the Indians, and the possession of this important position will induce them to retire. I have with me Pushmataha, who, with 51 warriors, accompanied by Lieutenant Callahan of the Volunteers, will march this morning and take up a position to intercept more effectually the communication of the enemy with Pensacola. A statement has been made to the writer by two contemporaries of the Creek War that while the army was at Weatherford's Bluff, Pushmataha went on an excursion with some of his warriors to Burnt Corn Creek. There he discovered a Creek camp upon which he made a night attack and killed several of the enemy, whose scalps his warriors bore in triumph back to Claiborne's camp. It is probable that this excursion may be the very one which General Claiborne, in the letter above, speaks of Pushmataha's making with 51 warriors in the direction of Pensacola. On the 28th of November, Colonel Gilbert C. Russell, the commander at Mount Vernon, arrived at Fort Claiborne with the 3rd Regiment of the U.S. Infantry. Agreeably to General Claiborne's desire, Colonel Russell had, at last, been ordered to cooperate with him. Pickett tells us that General Claiborne wrote on the 5th of December to General Jackson congratulating him upon his victories, giving him an account of the operations in the southern seat of war, and acquainting him with the fact that an abundance of corn and other provisions were to be obtained in the neighborhood of Fort Claiborne. He also wrote to Governor Blunt apprising him of the arrival of more English vessels in Pensacola, and added that he wished to God that he was authorized to take that sink of iniquity, the depot of Tories and instigators of disturbances on the southern frontier. 
He had a few days earlier dispatched Major Kennedy and others to Mobile to learn from Colonel Ballier the particulars of the arrival of the British at Pensacola. They reported giving satisfactory assurances that a large quantity of Indian supplies and many soldiers had arrived there, and in addition that the Indians were committing depredations in Baldwin County, having recently burned down Kennedy's and Burns' mills. Lieutenant Colonel George Henry Nixon had succeeded Russell in the command at Mount Vernon. At his request, Claiborne permitted him also to man Fort Pierce in the neighborhood of the disturbances. The year 1813 was now drawing to a close, and General Claiborne at last prevailed upon General Flournoy to authorize him to advance with his army into the Creek Nation. He accordingly resolved upon an expedition to Icona Chaca, the Holy Ground, situated about 120 miles above Fort Claiborne. Many of Claiborne's officers were opposed to this expedition into the heart of the Creek Nation, a written memorial of remonstrance signed by these officers, giving their objections against the expeditions, was placed in General Claiborne's hands. We reproduce this memorial from Claiborne's Mississippi. The undersigned volunteer officers as Republican soldiers, devoted to their government, and warmly attached to yourself, and disclaiming any authority to remonstrate or complain, nevertheless respectfully ask permission to lay their opinions before you in relation to the movement into the Creek Nation. Considering that winter and the wet season have set in, the untrodden wilderness to be traversed, the impossibility of transporting supplies for the want of roads, that most of our men are without winter clothing, shoes, or blankets, that a large majority of those ordered to march will be entitled to their discharge before the expedition can be accomplished. For these and other considerations, we trust that the enterprise may be reconsidered and abandoned, declaring at the same time that be your decision what it may, we shall cheerfully obey your orders and carry out your plans. Notwithstanding the truly forcible objections to the expedition presented in this remonstrance, General Claiborne adhered to his resolve. From Claiborne's Mississippi, we quote the following, their objections were stated with dignity, feeling, and respect, which these officers had always manifested. But these abused, calumniated defenders of their country, in a situation to try the stoutest heart, rose superior to privation and suffering. As soon as the order to march was issued, each man repaired promptly to his post. Many whose term of service had expired, and who had not received a dollar of their arrearages, volunteered for the expedition and with cheerful alacrity moved to their stations in the line. This included every officer who signed the address. Yes, continues the general, when they were exposed in these swamps and cane breaks to an inclement weather, without tents, warm clothes, shoes, or food, when every countenance exhibited suffering, when they were nine days without meat and subsisted chiefly on parched corn, these brave men won an important battle and endured without a murmur the exigencies of the service. On the 13th of December, the army left Fort Claiborne and took up the line of march toward the noted holy ground of the Creek Nation. The force consisted of the 3rd Regiment of the U.S. Infantry, commanded by Colonel Russell, Major Cassell's Battalion of Cavalry, Major Smoot's Battalion of Militia, of which Patrick May was adjutant, and Dale and Hurd captains, the 12-month Mississippi Territory Volunteers under Colonel Carson, and Pushmataha's Choctaw Battalion, numbering according to Pickett 150 warriors. The entire army amounted to near 1,000 men. After several days' march in a northeastern direction, the army reached the highlands south of Double Swamp in the present county of Butler. Here, General Claiborne built a depot called Fort Deposit, where he left his wagons, cannon, baggage, and the sick, with 100 men as a guard. On the morning of the 22nd, the troops again took up the line of march through the pathless forest, and late in the afternoon made their camp within 10 miles of the holy ground. A full description of the holy ground of the creeks may perhaps be an acceptable digression to the reader of these pages. We quote from A.B. Meek, The holy ground proper was situated along the south bank of the Alabama River, between Pensalala and Big Swamp Creeks, in the present county of Lowndes. It received its name from being the residence of the principal prophets of the nation, and having been by them consecrated from the intrusion of white men. Wizard circles were described around its borders, and the credulous inhabitants were assured that no enemy could tread upon its soil without being blasted. 
It was emphatically called the Grave of White Men, a more fertile and beautiful tract of country, especially when clothed with the vegetation of springtime, does not exist in our state, and it was thickly populated by the Aborigines. Near the mouth of Pentlala stood a village of 80 wigwams. The chief town, a few miles below, contained 200 houses, and here the council house of the Alabama tribe was situated. It is with this chief town to which the name Holy Ground will be restricted that the main interest of our narrative is concerned. At the outbreak of the war, many of the Indians carried their families into this town. After the massacre of Fort Mims, it became the headquarters of Weatherford, Hassa Yohola, Josiah Francis, and other chiefs. The town was designed by these chiefs not only as a place of refuge for their women and children, but as a depot for provisions and military supplies and a point to which those discomfited in battle might retreat. In short, the base of Creek military operations. The site of Holy Ground Town is about two miles north of the present town of Whitehall. Holy Ground Creek rises near Whitehall and flows northward to the Alabama River. On nearing the river, which here runs nearly west, the creek deflects somewhat to the northeast before emptying into the river. Within this horseshoe or peninsula formed by the creek and the river stood Holy Ground Town. About half a mile above the mouth of the creek and on its west side is a small spring branch emptying into the creek. It is now locally known as Sprott Spring Branch. About midway between this spring branch and the mouth of the creek, also on its west side, is another spring. This latter spring doubtless furnished the main supply of water to the people of the Holy Ground. Between the two springs is a low hollow emptying into the creek, which may have been a small branch in primitive days, but now shallow from the washings of the cultivated soil. On the western border of the Holy Ground are two ravines, each about 200 yards long, and emptying into the Alabama River. The course of one ravine is to the north, the other to the northwest, and their mouths unite on the banks of the river. Meek states that the holy ground was enclosed with pickets. If so, we conjecture that the pickets must have extended across the neck of the land from the lower spring on Holy Ground Creek to a point on the river just above the two ravines. The enclosed area would embrace about 50 acres. In addition to the pickets, a long, low pile of finely split lightwood was laid on the outside of the town, extending entirely across the neck of land. The prophets assured their credulous people that should the white people ever come and attempt to make an assault on their town, they would fire this consecrated fuel, whereupon every white man would at once fall lifeless to the earth. Such was the creek holy ground, and its warriors no doubt deemed that its sacred precincts would be forever secure from the intruding footsteps of an invading foe. Notwithstanding all their vaunted professions of belief in the impregnability of their town, the authorities of the holy ground early on the morning of the 23rd, when they became aware of the approach of Claiborne's army, had the good sense to take the precaution to convey their women and children across the river, and lodge them securely in the thick forest of what is now known as the Dutch Bend of Otaga County. About 11 o'clock the same morning, the army arrived within about two miles of the holy ground. Here, General Claiborne ordered a short halt. We conjecture a few hundred yards north or northwest of the present town of Whitehall, and made his disposition for attack on the place. His plan was to surround the town in such a manner that the enemy could not escape. He divided his troops into three columns, the center commanded by Colonel Russell, at the head of which was Claiborne himself, consisted of the 3rd Regiment of the U.S. Infantry, with Lester's Guards and Wells Dragoons acting as a corps of reserve. The right column consisted of the 12 months Mississippi Territory Volunteers, commanded by Colonel Carson. The left was composed of Major Smoot's Battalion of Militia and Pushmataha's Battalion of Choctaw Warriors, both under the command of Major Major Smoot. Colonel Carson was instructed to attack the creeks upon the upper side of the town, while Major Cassell's riflemen were ordered to take a position on the river bank west of the town to prevent their escape down the river. The plan of battle now arranged, the army was put in motion towards the town. 
The central column, after marching for a short distance, halted for a while so as to give the right and left columns time to reach their respective places on the upper and lower sides of the town. We follow the fortunes of Carson's column. It was evidently General Claiborne's instruction, or at least his desire, that Carson's column should cross Holy Ground Creek and march down along its right bank so as to strike the upper side of the town. But in consequence of an impassable reed break, this could not be done, and Carson was compelled to march down along the left bank. It was a very cold day, and for nearly a mile Carson's men, with great difficulty, marched or rather waited over a level piney woods country, covered with water from six inches to two feet deep. Upon emerging from the chilly waters to firmer land, the troops heard issuing from the holy ground the loud shouts and yells of the Creek warriors, and the roll of their drums showing that the Indians were advised of their approach. Carson's men were the first troops to strike the enemy. About midday they came within sight of the town. A short distance from the town and athwart Carson's line of march was a branch emptying into Holy Ground Creek. At this lapse of time it is impossible to determine whether this branch was the Spot Spring branch or the hollow beyond, both referred to above. Our opinion inclines to the latter. In this branch, and behind a large, long log lying parallel with it, and on the side towards Carson, was posted a large body of warriors. As Carson's men, now in line of battle, came within gunshot, they were suddenly greeted with a volley of rifle bullets from the creek ambuscade, and the battle began. The soldiers returned the fire and pressed steadily forward. Taking advantage of every tree and stump, they moved near and near the enemy, who, under the lead of Weatherford, stubbornly held their ground. On the west side of the branch, immediately in the rear of the creek gunmen, were many warriors equipped with bows, who sent an incessant shower of arrows towards the American line. But the missiles, shot too high, fell mostly harmless in Carson's rear. A prophet was seen in the midst of the creek bowmen frantically rushing to and fro, waving a red dyed cow's tail in each hand, and uttering the most appalling yells. Sometimes he would rush behind a cabin that stood nearby, and then would return at full speed, with his never ceasing wild and frenzied gesticulations. Some of the soldiers, finally making an oblique movement, passed around the log and gave the Indians a severe, enfilading fire, whereby several were killed and wounded. At the same time, some of the whites were wounded, but this fire caused the creeks to retreat across the branch. Still, from other points, from behind trees and among the fallen timbers, they continued to resist their enemies. The battle had now lasted about half an hour, when the other troops began to make their appearance upon the field. Major Cassells had found it impossible to reach the position assigned him on the western side of the town. On account of the extensive marsh connecting with the big swamp, which lay in front of his line of march, this unforeseen obstacle caused him to fall back on the head of Carson's regiment. The 3rd Regiment, Major Smoot's Battalion, and Pushmataha's warriors had now taken a position in front of the holy ground, and the enemy began to give way. About this time, a soldier of Carson's command, named Gatlin, resting his musket against a tree and taking deliberate aim, stretched the prophet lifeless upon the earth, the ball shattering his arm and piercing his breast. Colonel Carson, who had up to this time endeavored to restrain the ardor of his men, wishing merely to keep the enemy engaged until the town could be completely invested from the creek to the river, now saw that this object could not be effected, so he shouted to his men, Boys, you seem keen! Go ahead and drive them! The eager soldiers took their colonel at his word, and rapidly pressed the retreating foe back into the town. The Indians now fled in all directions, many casting away their arms, in accordance with a laudable custom peculiar to the Creeks, they bore off all the wounded warriors that were unable to make their escape. Carson's men pursued the Indians through the town to a bluff near Holy Ground Creek. The fugitives here crossed and some fled to the neighboring cane break, while others crossed the river, some in boats, others by swimming. One of the last retreating warriors received a mortal wound and fell upon the very edge of the bluff. Here he tossed to and fro for a few moments, in mortal agony, and then rolled headlong down the slope. The mouth of Holy Ground Creek was not the only avenue of escape to the discomfited Creek warriors. According to Pickett, hundreds of them made their escape along the Alabama River, by the western border of the town. These warriors evidently made their escape at this point before the close of the battle. 
Weatherford was the last man to retreat from the holy ground, the defense of which he had conducted with judgment and courage. We here introduce him for Major J.D. Drysdeck's sketch of the noted chieftain. When Weatherford found that most of his warriors had deserted him, he thought of his own safety. Finding himself hedged in above and below, he determined to cross the Alabama River. He was mounted on a horse of almost matchless strength and fleetness. He turned down a long hollow that led to the bank of the river. On his arrival, he found the bluff about 12 feet high. He took in at rapid glance the situation and determined to make the leap. He rode back about 30 paces and turned his horse's head towards the bluff. And then, with touch of the spur and the sharp hoya of his voice, he put the noble animal to the top of his speed and dashed over the bluff, full 20 feet into the flashing waters below, which opened its bosom to receive the dauntless hero, who sought its sparkling waters as a barrier between him and the pursuing foe. He did not lose his seat. His horse and the lower part of his body went entirely under the water, he holding the rifle above his head. The gallant horse struck out for the opposite shore with his fearless rider upon his back. When he had advanced some thirty yards from the shore, the balls from the guns of the troopers who were above and below him began to spatter around him like hail. But it appeared that the great spirit watched over him, for not a shot struck either man or horse. As soon as he reached the further shore, he dismounted and took off his saddle, and examined his brave and noble horse to see if he had been struck. One shot had cut off a bunch or lock of the horse's mane, just in front of the saddle. Finding his noble arrow, the horse's name, unhurt, he resaddled him and mounted, and, sending back a note of defiance, rode off to fight again on other ensanguined fields. A digression may here be permitted. A Mr. Sprott, a man of great intelligence, was the first American settler on Holy Ground Creek. According to a tradition coming down from him, and still current with the people of the vicinity, the ravine that runs northwest was the ravine down which Weatherford rode when he made his wonderful leap. General Woodward in his reminiscences has attempted to cast discredit upon the reality of this incident. We quote his language. Weatherford was among the last to quit the place. He made an attempt to go down the river, that is, down the bank of the river, but found that the soldiers would intercept his passage, and he turned up the stream, keeping on the bluff near the river, until he reached the ravine or little branch that makes into the river above where the town used to be. There was a small footpath that crossed the ravine near the river. He carried his horse down that path, and instead of going out of the ravine at the usual crossing, he kept up it towards its head until he passed the line of the whites. So now you have the bluff jumping story. General Woodward was evidently unfamiliar with the topography of the Holy Ground. There are only two ravines at the Holy Ground, the two already described, both of which are only 200 yards long and quite shallow towards their heads. Weatherford could not have gone to the rear of the American lines by riding up the bottom of either of these ravines, and as to the ravine or little branch that makes into the river above where the town used to be, this was Holy Ground Creek, which was certainly full of water on the day of the battle, as it was a rainy season. Weatherford could not have made his escape by riding or leading his horse up the channel of this creek. In addition to this, Carson's men already had possession of the mouth of Holy Ground Creek at the time when Weatherford was making his escape. These facts should be sufficient to show the absurdity of General Woodward's position. As a rejoinder to General Woodward's unwarrantable skepticism, and as evidence corroborating Major Drysback's narrative, we quote from the manuscript notes of Rev. John Brown of Mississippi. In early life, I was well acquainted with James Bankston, I have often heard Bankston say that he was of the party that pursued Weatherford at the Holy Ground, when he made his horseback leap into the Alabama River, and that when he was crossing the river his pursuers fired their guns at him. On reaching the other shore and thus being beyond the range of gunshot, Bankston said that Weatherford dismounted, unsaddled his horse, wrung the water out of his blankets and other articles, then again resaddling he mounted and rode off. This was Bankston's statement of Weatherford's exploit, of which he was an eyewitness, and I believe that his statement is true in every particular. General Claiborne forbade his white soldiers pillaging the holy ground, but gave all the spoils of the place to Pushmataha's warriors. The Choctaws made a complete sack of the town. 
loading themselves with provisions, clothing, blankets, and many silver ornaments. Much of this booty, the clothing, and the blankets, is said once to have been the property of the ill-fated inmates of Fort Mims. From 12 to 1,500 bushels of corn were found, a sufficient part of which was appropriated for the use of the army, and the remainder destroyed. The most interesting trophy of the Holy Ground was a letter found in Weatherford's house, written by Governor Manique to the Creek Chiefs, congratulating them on the victory of Fort Mims. During the general search which engaged the attention of many of the soldiers, John Brown, one of Carson's men, entered a cabin after it had been plundered, and a Creek woman who had strangely escaped the notice of the Choctaw pillagers came forth from her hiding place, and by signs appealed to him for mercy and protection. The soldiers the soldier conducted her to General Claiborne, who ordered that she should be well cared for, and that whenever practicable she should be restored to her friends. In the middle of the public square of the Holy Ground, the soldiers took down a tall pine pole, standing at an angle about 60 degrees, on which were hung 300 scalps which the Creeks had taken at Fort Mims. They were of every description, from the infant to the gray head. This ghastly sight, as we may well imagine, filled the spectators with emotions of horror and revenge. When the Choctaws had secured all their booty, Claiborne ordered the place to be burned. As a group of soldiers were standing idly gazing on the burning town, they saw a cabin door suddenly fly open, and a large mulatto slave bounded forth. He had scarcely cleared the threshold when a dozen rifles and muskets blazed forth and he fell dead. He was supposed to be a runaway slave who had taken refuge among the creeks, and wishing to avoid being captured had secreted himself, as he supposed safely in this cabin. But the fire drove him from his lair, and he sprang forth only to meet the quick doom of death. The American loss at the Holy Ground was one man killed, Ensign Luckett, and 20 wounded. This extremely slight loss, considering the bravery with which the enemy fought, must doubtless be ascribed to the scarcity of ammunition among the Creeks, which compelled many of them to have recourse to bows and arrows. The Creeks had 33 killed, of whom 21 were Indians, and 12 were black men, for on this occasion the Creeks had forced their slaves to help bear the brunt of battle. The number of their wounded is not known, as they succeeded in bearing them all off the field. Among the slain of the Indians, writes Dr. Neil Smith, was found one of the Shawnee prophets, who was said to have first raised the disturbance with the whites, and a singer in the Creek Nation, and the leading prophet of the Creeks is said to have been mortally wounded, and dropped a noted gun, which was well known. The Shawnee prophet was probably the man that Gatlin killed. The Choctaws scalped all the Creek warriors slain at the Holy Ground. It may well be here to state that the Holy Ground was the only battle in the terrible Creek War in which slaves bore arms on behalf of their red owners. In all other engagements, Muscogee Valor alone sustained the tug of war. Kenny Hajo, a Creek warrior at the Holy Ground, speaking of this battle in after years, censured his countrymen severely for making use of their slaves in this engagement. He said that the proud and warlike Muscogees on this occasion had compromised the dignity of their nation in stooping so low as to call to their aid the services of their slaves to assist them in fighting the battles of their country. That this act, too, was especially exasperating to the whites, and tended to increase the bitterness of their prejudices against the Creeks. The army camped the night following the battle near the ruins of the Holy Ground. The next day was devoted to the destruction of the enemy's towns, farms, and boats. General Woodward states that after the massacre of Fort Mims, many of the Creeks returned to a village situated on a place afterwards embraced in Townsend Robinson's plantation. This and every other settlement in the Holy Ground territory was that day destroyed. A.B. Meek relates an incident which must have been a part of this day's work. In writing of Major Austell, he says that he, in particular, distinguished himself at the Holy Ground by crossing the river in a canoe with Pushmataha, the great Choctaw chief, and six warriors in front of the enemy's fire, putting a large party to flight, and capturing a considerable quantity of baggage and provisions. There is a tradition current among some of the aged Choctaws of Mississippi that the day after the Battle of the Holy Ground, in some manner a Creek camp was discovered on the west side of the river. Pushmataha took some of his warriors in the afternoon, crossed over in a boat, and approached this camp without ever being seen. 
Pushmataha then gave the signal to his men by shouting, Husa, Husa, Momabi, Momabi, shoot, shoot, kill all, kill all. Whereupon his warriors opened fire and killed two or three of the enemy. The remainder fled. The Choctaws secured the booty of the camp and then returned across the river to the army. This tradition no doubt commemorates the same exploit recorded by Judge Meek, but perhaps embellished with some aboriginal exaggeration. The same afternoon of this Choctaw exploit, while the cavalry were on their way up the river to destroy the town at the mouth of the Pentlala Creek, they encountered not far from the town three Shawnees, who retreated into a reed break. The troopers surrounded the break and, through an interpreter, called upon them to surrender, offering to spare their lives. But the Shawnees resolutely rejected every overture. Both sides then opened fire and a fight of two hours ensued. The Shawnees would load their guns, come to the edge of the break, deliver their fire, then return to their covert, and their reloading would again return to the post of danger. The soldiers at last prevailed, and the Shawnees were slain. The firing of this slight engagement being heard in Claiborne's camp, he marched in that direction during the early part of the night, and then camped on Weatherford's plantation where the troops passed the remainder of the night exposed to a cold, drenching rain. A part of the next day, which was Christmas 1813, was passed, still further laying waste the country, after which, there being nothing further to be done, the army marched back to Fort Deposit, and thence in three or four days to Fort Claiborne. Tradition relates that while the army was on its return, the artillerymen on several occasions fired off their cannon, supposing that this would strike terror into any revengeful party of the Creeks that might be dogging their march. On General Claiborne's arrival at Fort Claiborne, writes J.F.H. Claiborne, Carson's Mississippi Volunteers and the cavalry were mustered out of service, and there were only 60 men left whose term would expire in a month. These troops, the general complains, had been permitted to serve without clothing or shoes, and had been disbanded with eight months' pay due to them. What a commentary on the War Department of that day! What an illustration of the patience and patriotism of the Volunteers of Mississippi! The volunteers had served over and above their time, had remained from attachment to their general, and started on their weary journey for their distant homes on the Pearl, the Amity, and the Mississippi without a cent of their pay. Their general soon followed as poor as themselves, and with a constitution broken by exposure, he soon died. In chronicling the disappearance of Claiborne's army from history, it may be just to add that his red allies under Pushmataha were likewise mustered out of service at Fort Claiborne, and at once began their march to their homes beyond the Tom Bigby. They bore upon their scout poles the tokens of Muscogee defeat and disaster, and in every Choctaw village they entered they sang their savage war song and danced their exulting scalp dance over the ghastly trophies of the holy ground. The joy and enthusiasm with which the news of the defeat of the Creeks at the Holy Ground was received by the people of the Alabama frontier may be realized from the following extracts from a letter, dated December 31, 1813, written from St. Stephen's by Thomas Vaughn and addressed to General Claiborne. Sir, Ensign Burton arrived here last night about 10 o'clock with a pleasing intelligence that you gained a complete victory at the Holy Ground. I made the communication to Captain Davis, and we had the fort illuminated and gave you three cheers at the front gates, and the rear gates, and on the Grand Parade, with appropriate music and air named by Captain Davis, Claiborne's Victory. The citizens by this time had discovered the cause of our rejoicing and illuminated generally. We then marched through the town with music amid the joyful acclamations of the citizens. On every countenance the gleam of joy appeared to beam, and the name of Claiborne, his gallant officers and men, resounded from one end of the town to the other, and the night was passed with a general rejoicing such as was never before experienced at St. Stephen's. The defeat of the Creeks at the Holy Ground practically closed their military career in southern Alabama. Elsewhere on other fields against the armies of Floyd and Jackson, and in the swamps of Florida, the struggle was continued by the heroic race of red men with a courage, patience, and patriotism that have elicited the wonder and admirations of the historians of Mississippi and Alabama. 
The achievements of the Creeks, write Claiborne, rival the prodigies of antiquity. Only a brief outline of the story of the remainder of this unparalleled struggle against the boundless military resources of the white man will be recorded in the subsequent pages. And now we flatter ourselves that we have fully redeemed our promise to our readers in giving them a full and exhaustive history of the Creek War in southern Alabama. In 1894, the writer visited the battlefield of the Holy Ground and thoroughly familiarized himself with its topography. It may not be amiss in these notes to refer to a statement in Pickett's History of Alabama, that the Creek Prophets had caused many white persons and friendly Indians to be burned to death at the Holy Ground, and that when General Claiborne's army was almost in sight of the town, Mrs. Sophia Durant and several other friendly half-breeds were mustered in the square and surrounded by lightwood fires designed to consume them. We have no desire to cast discredit upon this statement, yet it is singular that no contemporary records make mention of this matter. No reference is made to it in General Claiborne's official report of the Battle of the Holy Grounds, nor in N. H. Claiborne's notes on the war in the South, published in 1819, nor in the letter referred to above of Dr. Neil Smith, who was a participant in the battle. We will also add that no reference is made to it in the manuscript notes of Reverend John Brown, which are in reality the recollections of another participant in the battle. Some years ago, this statement of Pickett's was brought to the notice of General Pleasant Porter of the Creek Nation, who was well informed in the ancient usages of his people. The general utterly disbelieved the statement. He said that he never heard a hint as to the Creeks burning prisoners at the stake. He said that on the contrary, such a practice would be a direct violation of their superstitious or religious beliefs, that dead bodies were shunned as among the Jews, and that when a person was killed, there was a special detail of men to bury the corpse as soon as possible, as the spirits of the dead were regarded as disquieting or dangerous agents around them as long as their bodies remained unburied, and they would fear to torture the dying, lest they their spirit should take revenge on them before their bodies could be buried. So that's it for this episode. This is episode 6 of 7 in our series based on the 1895 book, The Creek War of 1813 and 1814. This book focuses mainly on the Creek War in southern Alabama, but in the next episode in this series, we will hear about Andrew Jackson's campaign in northern Alabama as he came down from Tennessee. At the end of this story, we heard about the unfortunate death of General Claiborne shortly after this war in 1815. Colonel Carson, who led the militia of Mississippi Volunteers, who were the first to engage the Creeks during the battle, would die just two years after General Claiborne in 1817. This channel is called Unworthy History because we talk about actual history that is now deemed unworthy to discuss on history channels on TV, and because we talk about people who lived much harder lives than we have to, people whose shoes we are unworthy to stand in. If you'd like to support the mission of this channel, then consider joining our Patreon page or becoming a member of our YouTube channel. Patreon and YouTube channel members will be recognized at the end of each episode, and they they will also have access to additional members-only videos that we will release from time to time. For this episode, there is an additional short video that discusses how the Choctaws treated the Creek slaves who had died in the Battle of the Holy Ground. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.